Okay, so this is the third video lecture, um, the first chapter of psychology. In the second, in the previous lecture, we I left off. We were just uh, left off talking about some of the people that predate some of the the founder of psychology and Titchener and William James. In this lecture, I want to talk about some of the 20th century psychologists. Um, these names may sound a bit more familiar to you. Um, yeah, and I think that's, we'll see how far we get with that. So, and again, the the question is not that I'd ask you to match, uh, to match these people up, but I do ask, especially with this fellow, with Sigmund Freud, right? I do ask that you, in a quiz question, what is Freud's contribution? Like, what was Freud's contribution and how does it continue to affect psychology today? Um, and that, the answer to that question is psychoanalysis. So hopefully you've heard of Sigmund Freud, right? He gets kind of a bad rap um, because of some of his ideas were a little, what we would consider to be kind of outrageous or inappropriate, but his big contribution, and this is the answer to the question, is psychoanalysis and the under and the importance of unconsciousness. So I would guess that you, we would all probably agree or accept the idea that things that we're not aware of affect our behavior, right? That we have feelings and thoughts, our subconscious feelings, um, that they influence how we think about people or things like this. And that was, uh, that is attributed to Sigmund Freud, right? The role of the unconscious. Now, where he's criticized a little bit is where he gets into things like um, the uh, penis envy or the Oedipus conflict because a lot of his research or a lot of his explanations had to do with sexuality and had to do with violence. He's also discredited because the bulk of his research subjects were actually his clients and that's and he used himself as a research subject and that's considered inappropriate. Um, but, you know, if any of you have therapy, and I believe everybody should have a therapist on call, you can thank Freud for even the phenomena of psychotherapy. However, his way he was doing psychotherapy is different than we do it today. Today, you typically sit in a, you know, in a space and you're face to face with each other and it's kind of equal and maybe a little bit not intimate, in, emotionally intimate, right? But in Freud's day, um, he would, you'll see pictures, there's a great Star Trek episode actually, you'll see pictures where um, Freud is sitting here and his subject is laying away, right? And that was to create like this in unequity. And, and it was considered like, if you think about somebody laying down, we subconsciously see them as sick, as ill. Um, and so there was just an, this inequity. But the answer to the question, psychoanalysis and subconscious. But we will talk more about Freud when we get to the chapter on dreams and drugs because of his, his ideas. So another fella that maybe you've heard of, I don't know, is Watson. And Watson is considered to be a behavioralist. And there's, I've got a couple slides here specific to individual behaviorists because the the notion of what behaviorism is and i don't know if it's in this class but in one of my classes i have an activity uh, where you have to think about examples of behavioralism but the notion is that we can train well if you have dogs if you train dogs right that's or or animal behavioralists they're using the psychology that we attribute to this fella named watson to condition or to modify your dog's behavior, right? Well, the Watson's famous for his research on a small child that in the history books is referred to as little Albert. And he demonstrated, um, and I think this is a quiz question too, what can we learn from Watson's research, right? So he takes little Albert here and the story goes, history books tell us that Little Albert was the student, was the child of one of Watson's students. Little Albert, to begin with, is not afraid of rats or white rabbits. But Watson conditions or trains Albert to be afraid of this by, and you can see it in this bottom picture, he would hand the child a rat or a bunny and he would bang about a loud noise, right? He'd, bang, he'd make this loud noise in the background and the child would startle, would become afraid. And he did this over and over and over again. And eventually, as you would guess, the child learns to be afraid of white fluffy things 
white soft things because he has associated white fluffy things with fear. Now again, if you have a dog, um, probably even a cat or other animals too, you've seen this behavior. Like in my dog, if I walk over and pick up the bowl, the dog assumes that we're actually, even if I put on my shoes, if I put on a certain pair of sandals, he thinks we're going outside because he has associated those two things with each other. So the question is, what does Watson's research contribute or what does Watson's research demonstrate? Well, it, it demonstrated that we could learn to be afraid of something we're not naturally afraid of. We could be conditioned to fear. What the behavioralists are interested in are things that they can see. And you have a lot of behavioralist work in things like uh, marketing and oh, what do they call it when they organize um, uh, merchandising, right? So like if you go to the store, like in caps, uh, the items that are in the aisle, that's all somebody has thought about. How do people act, right? And can we change the environment in a way that changes their behavior? That all comes out of the of the field of psychological behavioralism, right? Change the environment, change the way people act, teach them to associate things with each other, and then watch what happens. Because behaviorals, where Freud is interested in the things that we're not aware of, our subconscious, behaviorists are interested in the way people act, what they can see, and yeah, what they can see and what we can measure and what we can count. How many pairs of socks? How many bottles of shampoo did people buy? How many? Oh, that kind of thing. Okay, another behaviorist that's kind of famous is this guy named B.F. Skinner. And he's famous, I don't have it bolded on here, for his air cribs. Yeah, I don't have the word on here at all. This is a picture of the air crib. And he theorized that if you gave him a child at the very beginning and you allowed him to control all aspects of this child's life, including, in this case, the air, right? So the air crib had perfect temperature, perfect noise control, um, perfect humidity, that if you perfected the child's environment, you, he could mold that child to become anything he wanted or you wanted, right? Right? that it, through environmental inputs, you could mold somebody in how to act and ask any parent, right, whose kid is of any age, and they will say, uh, you can do, you can try your hardest, but you can't make a kid become something your kid's not going to become. Uh, and, and anyway, so this is the air curb. He's also a behavioralist. Another one that hopefully you're familiar with is Pavlov. Pavlov is the fella who's famous for the dogs. So if you've ever heard the phrase, a Pavlovian response, that's attributed to the research on Pavlov. Now, this top box up here, it uses phrases uh, that if you were to take, we might cover this in a later chapter, but terms like unconditioned response, conditioned response, unconditioned stimulus, that can get really confusing unless you spend quite a bit of time trying to learn what they mean. But basically what it boils down to is Pavlov took a dog, took dogs, lots of dogs, and he he began with, showed the dog food, dog salivated. That's a natural, unconditioned, unlearned response. Give a dog a bone, they'll salivate. He would ring a bell, right? Dogs didn't salivate, nothing happened. That's an unconditioned response. Nothing happens. Um... Yeah, or an unconditioned, anyway, he gives them a bell. He would give them a bone and a bell at the same time. Give them a bone, ring a bell. If, again, if you've ever click or trained your dog, you're using the principles of Pavlovian behavioral training, right? That dog is learning to associate the click with the treat. And eventually, you can take the treat away. And that's exactly what Pavlov did. He would ring, he would ring the bell, give them a bone, and then they would salivate. Eventually, because they had learned to associate bell and bone, he was able to take away the bone and ring the bell and the dog salivates. So in the clicker training with dogs, with any animal really, eventually you can take the treat away and you can just click to get their attention. And so other, uh, so like things like Pavlovian response means that a person has learned to associate something non, non-biological now causes a biological reaction. 
Um, well, all of them I can think of are really pretty R-rated examples. Um, trying to think. So maybe if you have a certain, oh, I, I know. So maybe if your parents used a, um, they spanked you or something that whenever you see a belt, oh, I have better examples I can think of with dogs. So like my, again, my, my mom had a rescue dog and every time she would, the dog would see a fly swatter, the dog would run and hide. Right, the fly swatter it means nothing, but the dog had learned fly swatter means fear. What does a child? What does a dog do when they're afraid? They run off. So when our body begins to, or in some cases maybe certain smells will cause anxiety, or certain sounds will cause us to react. I think about when I first got a cell phone. That every time I, every time I got a, a certain text message, um, I would feel this like surge of joy. Well, we'll talk about that in another chapter. That's dopamine, right? Dopamine. And I had, there was pleasure. When we experience pleasure, it causes a dopamine surge. Dopamine makes us feel good. Every time your, you know, your phone would, would ding, there would be pleasure. So because you got a text message, this is in the early days, because you got a text message and now you associate the ding with feeling good because of the biological reaction. That's, that's really Pavlov's connection is he was able to associate non-biological things with biological response. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And in the next one, I'm going to talk about um, some humanist psychologists and the different places that you might find psychologists working.